worship you. We thank you for your presence. Your presence on this stage, your presence out there. Father, we thank you. Just very, very thankful, very thankful for the practicality of your healing and power and your virtue. Lord, as we've prayed over members of this congregation privately this week and experienced the power in prayer, speaking over their lives and their bodies, Lord, teach us, teach us as ministers of the gospel, this gospel, train us of the how-tos to allow this virtue and presence to transfer itself over into the account of the physical. For the same God that we feel His presence in spirit will also transfer over into the natural, into the physical. So in Jesus' name, I speak the life of God and release the very miracle working God in and through this congregation in Jesus name those that are believing for abnormal things that have been there for a long time for things that have taken up residency in the flesh Lord this is our this is our food this is our menu this is what we eat this is the children's bread is to see miracles Lord this is all part the reality of the God that we each feel in our spirit, the presence, the denoting of that presence of peace and the energizing of a want to, to know God. Lord, the same God that is in presence is the same God that transfers over into the physical. So in Jesus name, I speak life. I speak an infusion of life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I release life. Let the very material presence, the very essence of the reality of a spiritual being, the Holy Ghost, in person of God, the very person of God, in Jesus' name, I command that crippled places and organs and diseased areas and places that have been injured and places that have undergone a debit, a be, Debilitation, a debilitation in the name of Jesus I command those places restored in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ now in the name of Jesus let that which is in presence go into the physical that which is felt by the Spirit transcend itself into the physical in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ receive the life of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ receive the healing of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be raised up in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ see in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ hear in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ pain I command you to go command life into the hearts the physical hearts specifically into the physical hearts in the name of Jesus specifically into Lord let that person that is invisible the spirit man who is encased with life the very life of God let that power now begin to transcend itself past from the spirit into the physical and those who do not have that golden man on the inside Lord it was your great delight throughout the Gospels to heal those from the outside we that are living in him are healed from the inside the Holy Ghost coming on us is already in us cooperating with his very own self let the power of God flow from out of that golden man in the name of Jesus but those that are outside of Christ Lord 
in Jesus name because you love them because you love them and you will heal their bodies even before they pledge their allegiance to you in Jesus name be made whole receive the life of God receive the very essence of the healing power of Jesus Christ nobody loved us like this nobody loved anyone to give them healing even before they would give an allegiance to them only you Jesus only you the healing virtue of God kidneys I command you hold in the name of Jesus I command you hold in the name of Jesus hearts I command you there is no such thing among us no such thing among us as congestive heart failure weakening I command all of the arteries strong as Moses was 120 and his eye was not dim nor his natural strength abated Yes, I Lord. command that in the name of Jesus, that the, that the young and the old alike have the same internal organs filled with strength, filled with life, filled with the capacity to run this race to the end in full health in Jesus' name. Be raised up in the name of Jesus. No sickly among us. No sickly among us. No sickly among us. In the name of Jesus. No weak among us. No suffering among us. None in pain among us. In the name of Jesus. It is written. It is written. It is written. If this gospel is the same gospel, and it is, then the God that we feel in presence, the God that we feel in presence, is the same God that transcends into the body in the name of Jesus 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 hallelujah no arthritis among us no crippling no osteoporosis no lupus no cancer no blood diseases no headaches no migraines we, Lord we pray that the hour is coming and now is that we scoff at these things we scoff, not in an arrogance of the flesh, but an absolute dependence on God. Not that our heads would be hanging down and we would be rubbing our brow with migraines, but in Jesus' name that we run through a troop and leap over a wall and we challenge the devils of infirmity in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, take from our mouths Take from our mouths confessions that have allowed these things. Purge us, our mouth. Forgive our sins that we have, we have allowed these things. And we've said this is the way that I am or this is the way that things have been and I always get this and this happens to me all the time. Lord, we only give permission for these things to remain. But let us have a great divorcement. Let us divorce ourselves from these things. Let us forsake these things. Let us walk. Lord, I pray that we'll have the pleasure of God far more than the pity of man. For many things are spoken so someone could know what we're suffering so we could have their pity. I would rather have your healing than the pity of man. Put a watch on my mouth that I have not the pity of man but I have the healing power of God in the name of Jesus. Put a watch on my mouth that I have not the pity of man, but I have the healing power of God in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to share it. I just want to lift it up before you and say, thank you, Lord, it's done. That's where we stand. That's where we stand. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. These things are coming. Watch and wait. Watch and wait. Watch and wait. 
saith the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Share this. Uh, I've just got to share it because it's been going on in my heart for about three weeks. And I've been putting it off and putting it off because I was thinking, is it just me that wants to do this? But I want to, I want to honor my husband this morning and say some things about him. I mean, if the president's wives can do it, why can't I? Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And about three weeks ago, I was sitting there in the morning, and, or no, we was, it was in the evening, and we was watching some news, and um, it was about, the, it, they were talking about the different men that have fought for our country, and those that have died, and my heart was going out, and Bronk made a statement that he said, man, I wished I would have been enlisted. He said, I wished I could, you know. I said, well, you're not now. But I was like, my, you know, I didn't think too much about it then. But when I woke up the next morning, I woke up and as just, just about every morning, he's up two or three hours before me. He's out there in his recliner and he's seeking the Lord. And the Lord began to speak to me and he said, you know, your husband is enlisted. He is enlisted in my army and he's in the, He's battling for an eternal reward, for an eternal life for the people. And he, God is so thankful for all the men that have enlisted and fought. And he's also so thankful and so proud of the men that are fighting to bring God's word into this earth. And I just want to thank God that my husband, he's really, really true to what he does here. He's the same here as he is at home. And he seeks the Lord all through the day and sometimes even through the night but he's up early and he's seeking God on your behalf and he loves you and he loves the people so much that he's given his life for it and there's he has no other ambition he doesn't have any hobbies he doesn't do anything but just sit at the house and pray and seek God and sometimes I feel sorry for him, but Lord doesn't, the Lord doesn't want me to. I'm like, God, sometimes I feel like he's become a hermit. He just sits there, just praying. But look at him. He's, he looks good, doesn't he? <laughs> but I just want to honor him and let you know that he is true, true to what he's doing. And this morning, all I could think of was that little kid song that says, I may never march in the infantry, fight with the cavalry, or shoot the artillery, but I'm in the Lord's army. I thank God for my husband this morning. I just want you to know that I know you know this, but you don't know it like I know it. How really he has poured his heart into what he's doing here. And we'll never quit. We'll just keep on. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much, honey. I really appreciate that. Greet each other. Hallelujah glory. Turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 6 just for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to exhort you. I'm so sorry I can't get around to saying hi to everybody, but uh, all of you are equally important, and we appreciate every single one of you being here this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Natalie's dad is, is with us. I don't, he's probably in the restroom, but David, we appreciate him being here with us. He's uh, visiting again. I hope he's getting Alex all straightened out. <clears throat> he sure needs it. Amen. Well, I want to say thank you for, uh, thank you to, to Candy. That was beautiful. And I certainly didn't expect it. And, uh, but appreciate that so much. Um, just want to exhort you for just a, a, a few moments because we de definitely need to get in to the word this morning. We got a, a lot to cover. Uh, but Jesus is, of course, speaking here, and this is Matthew 6, 7, and uh, uh, 5, 6, and 7, um, primarily talking about here in 6, uh, obviously with no ch chapter divisions, primarily talking about the kingdom of God and referencing to the kingdom of God and what it takes to have a kingdom of God mentality. Um, and he says, I'm just going to pick up in verse 19. I could go into, I could go forward and backwards and, and never catch all of this. But 19, you know he's talking about um, our disposition towards money, um, towards prosperity, 
and how that we're supposed to, to uh, believe God in relationship to living inside the kingdom. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, for where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for your, yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now we're going to cover this uh, scripture later. As I said, I made an announcement Wednesday night uh, that not this Wednesday night, I mean not this Sunday night. This Sunday night, by the way, is uh, young adults. Please come. Uh, Homer just doesn't, Homer and the Holy Ghost just always do an excellent, excellent job teaching and times laying hands on people. And it's just very, very powerful. And you'll want to be a part of that. But a, a week from this Sunday night, we're going to start. It's going to be very simple. Uh, there are more people in here that are qualified um, in knowledge than myself, but this is a, an acclamation of the Holy Spirit. We're going to teach you about three weeks on economics, just spiritual and, and, uh, and natural economics. Go cover everything from credit cards to uh, co-signing and how to build your credit and how to what things to do, not to do. Uh, investments. Um, I'm excited. I'm really excited. There's some good things that very, very simply that I can share with you. This particular verse of scripture here, he's not talking about uh, not uh, having any forethought of putting up anything or having anything, but it's all predicated on um, dissolving an, an anxiousness or a, uh, a want to that's always thinking about how much do I get out of it and which really breeds or brings into effect an anxiousness in your life um, it's not talking about wisdom that would lay up and that would have in store or even leave something good for your family so um, we will teach all that later but where your treasure is verse 21 in other words what you're really looking at is where your heart will be also now this is interesting verse, and he also uses this same teaching in Luke in a different setting, but we use this, and we'll refer back to it this morning when we're talking about another subject matter, but Jesus said this, the light of the body is the eye, okay, it's the, it's the light, in other words, the eye gate is the, the mechanism which allows light into the body. The light of the body of the, is the eye, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body is full of light. If thine eye be evil, thy whole body is full of darkness. If therefore the light that it be in thee, the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, Jesus says something here that can sound like a very contradictory statement. He said uh, concerning the eye, if the eye is single, the whole body is full of light. If the eye be evil, now that word evil uh, can also translate if you look it up, in the original, it can mean diseased or uh, mal uh, have, uh, having uh, malady, something that is there that is keeping it from having a full vision. It doesn't necessarily be, but what it's saying here is your perspective. That which allows perspective in all things in life, he's saying just like the eye to the body allows vision, the eye, the eye, you know, the light comes in, the, the brain, the, the, the eye does everything, the brain interprets it, and you see a picture in front of you. The, the brain is seeing a picture because of the light that is coming into the eye. So the eye is the, it's the gate. It's the gate of, of vision, obviously. Um, it's what causes the brain to say, I see what's in front of me. But he's saying here that he's using that as an analogy to say, um, if, if your physical eye is diseased, then you have a hard time seeing. In the same way, what he says, if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, that sounds really kind of, uh, in, in a certain sense, contradictory. How can light be darkness? But what he's saying here is, if your perspectives, now, we talked last week, and again, we'll talk about this morning, the, uh, uh, the intervention or uh, what 
bad teachers can have to do with the eye gate of the spirit, the bad perspectives, how that they have a part, a major part in doing that. But this is relative to, to whether it's your own perceived knowledge, the way that your mom and daddy brought you up or the way that you've raised yourself. It's just simply talking about if your perspective that you per perceive to be light is darkness. In other words, if what you hold to as relevance of truth, and this is the right way to think, and yet it's not, then it's a sabotage. Because what it sabotages is this. You'll just be real uh, biased towards that, and that's the way you'll see things. And so that light will be, even though it's darkness, will be light to you. It may not be light, but it's light to you. And it, if it's light to you, even though it's darkness, you'll swear to it as being light. You'll swear to, no, 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 this is light. This is, this is the way I should think. And that goes into, uh, especially as we're interpreting it in, in doctrinal issues, it's vital. It's very vital. And in, in, in another place, Jesus talks about it, not quite in this setting. But really, particularly in this setting, he is talking about money and how you view those kinds of things. And he's trying to change the order of the way people think so that the light that is in them is not darkness. He says, no man can serve uh, two masters, verse 24. He'll either hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money or mammon, um, prosperity to your own making. Um, Therefore, I say unto you, take no... Th so here, here he's going to change. He's going to heal the eye. He's going to heal the perspective. Uh, perspectives can be in a lot of different ways. Uh, what you think and how you feel. Um, but whoever and whatever and however we think, always the words of Jesus puts, us, puts the light in and it's true light. Can you say amen? It's not light tainted with darkness, it's true light. God, uh, this changes the perspective of, of people in the church, out of the church. If they know this to be truth, if this is the light that they perceive. Um, he basically is teaching a lot here. He's teaching uh, everything from your world shouldn't revolve around you. You know, you shouldn't be amassing things just for yourself. But he's also teaching uh, Jesus um, and his word. If you know his word, you understand this. God is not a socialist. He's absolutely not a socialist. In other words, uh, God says this in other scriptures. He says, if a man doesn't eat, he shouldn't. I mean, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. He shouldn't eat. He says, God's not a socialist. In other words, God's, God's not into entitlements. He doesn't believe just because you're a human being, you're entitled to get what everybody else gets, even though you don't do your part. He's not that way. Well, if you're physically enabled, well, we're going to teach this in the next few Wednesday nights. I need to... What's physically enabled? There's a man in the book of Proverbs who says he turns on his bed like a hinge. Or he says, there's a lion in the street. Well, I can't work. Right. I've got to have a time with God. Well, I'm, are you putting in like 16 resumes a day? Pounding the street? Have you burnt? You know, how many gallons of gas have you spent this week? How, how many internets? Have you, how many websites have you went on? Well, I was going to go get in the car and... It's predicted that it's supposed to rain today. Well, what does rain have to do? Well, I could catch pneumonia and then I wouldn't. That's what the man with the lion in the street, he says, he says there's a lion. I, I've heard that there, uh, there's a lion out there that might eat us if we go out today. So that's the, that, that's the description of a slothful person. There's always an excuse. There's always an excuse. I can't find a job. Why? I, well, there's all... Didn't I say that was Wednesday night? I mean, uh, Sunday night's teaching. Come on, you guys help me. Say, no, we don't... <laughs> Okay, God's not a socialist. God, okay, so all these perspectives come in and they, they push out darkness and they cause you to see what true light is. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What shall you eat or what shall you drink? Take no, and it does literally, I mean, I, 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 I checked up on this again. I knew it, but I checked up on it again. It does say take no anxious thought. There's two words. Of wor There's at least two words in the Greek for thought. One is just thinking. This is not just thinking. This is actually intended on getting down to worry. Take no worry for your life. 
what you, sh you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowl of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? So everybody say amen. We are better. Hallelujah. Which of you by taking this, there, here's this anxious thought, can add to his cubit one stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lily of the field, how they grow. They toil not, nor do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Hallelujah. How many of you know he'll take care of us? Amen. Was this predicated on how much you gave? Was it predicated on when you gave? No, he's just, that's daddy. That's daddy. So everything that we're doing is just because we love him and we want to see people saved. We just want to see people saved. Wherefore, take no thought, say, and that prayer, I didn't expect to pray that a, a while ago, clean up our mouths. But what, this is, this is what saying this, what shall we eat? How much, how are we going to get anything to drink? How are we going to be closed? For after all these things, clothed, after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But, here's the, one of the biggest buts in the Bible. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for tomorrow will take, will take thought for it. The things of itself, sufficient unto the day, is the evil thereof. Hallelujah. Praise God. Aren't you glad that we, we just give today because daddy, he's daddy. And then we can just turn it over to him. He's going he, he's gonna, to he's gonna, he's gonna pay it. He's going to make it. We're going to make it. Hallelujah. We're going to have more than enough. Praise the Lord. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for your great goodness. We ask you to bless in this time of giving. We pray that you'll uh, solidify our hearts and capture our hearts in the beauty of being able to express it in this, this place of worship. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me once again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you so much. Praise your name. Bless now your word. Take us to the next level. Prepare us. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I just love that song so much. We could have never guessed it, right, Pastor? <laughs> Why? Because it, it tells a story. It's, he's coming back. And he's going he's gonna to fix all this foolishness. He really is. There's no, going to be no parties, uh, no voting. <laughs> Man, I said Wednesday night he's coming back with an innumerable, the word says, amount of angels. Innumerable means that can't be counted. Can you imagine somebody saying, well, I don't think I want you ruling over me. It's not going to happen. There's however many, first of all, just, just first of all, if God wills it, there's nothing that you can do about it. I mean, it, it, this is a pitiful illustration, but the fact of the matter is, is that when he, on that day, divides the sheep from the goats, uh, and he says to the, to the goats, enter into everlasting punishment, there's nothing they're going to be able to do about it. They're, they're just... They'll just physically, just, it's just like God's everywhere and his power's everywhere and there's no resisting it. It's like they, they won't want to go into the lake of fire, but, but just in the next thought, they'll be there. If he says it, it just happens. That's how powerful he is. That's just one thing. I mean, he comes back and there won't be no de Democrats, there won't be no Republicans, there won't be no ISIS, there won't be anything. It's just for that thousand years, and besides for that, an innumerable amount of angels will be doing his bidding. <laughs> Can 
Can you imagine telling a, like a 10-foot angel, I don't think I'm going to do that. We're going to have a, we're going to have a, ral a rally outside. <laughs> one of those guys, just one of them, just one, uh, in the Old Testament <clears throat> at night, killed 185,000, 185,000 Assyrians in one night. Now that was just one. He sent one angel. And an innumerable amount of angels probably could do a pretty good damage on the earth. They probably could. So we're going to protest. <laughs> okay. Okay. See, I vote Jesus. I, he's got my vote. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. So, uh, we want to shout out to some people. Amarachi, is that correct? I, I, I wanted to make sure I have your name right, honey. Uh, she's living in Canada. She's been writing and supporting us now for a while, and uh, we got some people that actually met her, right? Fantastic. Praise the Lord. Uh, we said hi to Sierra uh, Wednesday night. And, uh, and that's Natalie's friend. And Natalie wasn't here Wednesday night, Sierra. So you were, but. <laughs> Did I say that? I didn't say that. <laughs> no, her husband was getting back from, from Haiti. And uh, we're glad to have her dad here, David, with us today. So fantastic. So wherever you're at in the world, just give us a shout out and send us an email and say hi. Amen. Um, turn with me once again uh, this morning. We're just going to recap some stuff that we've been uh, saying. And last week we were in 2 Peter chapter 2. I appreciate all of you being with us and these messages and listening you know, on uh, YouTube and people that are listening on the website. And uh, praise the Lord and all of you that are here supporting. When you pull with me, it really helps. And uh, God gave us uh, uh, an assignment now, uh, this will be the, I believe, the 11th week that we've been on this, and we've still got a few more to go. Uh, we've called it bayonet training. You've heard me explain this so many times that most of you could uh, recite it better than myself. But bayonet training basically is just depicting um, a close and personal kind of fighting. And I'm not talking about personal as in you taking it personal. I'm talking about close proximity. And uh, close proximity being within the church. And that that being exactly put doctrine and how that f doctrine is going to be challenged, true doctrine and false doctrine, and that it'll come in so close that it'll be, and it already is, among us. And it's among us. I'm not talking about necessarily this church, um, but I'm talking about the church worldwide and especially the American church, because the American church has so much availability to, uh, to the social media and to technology, and there are voices. You know, you can, uh, nowadays, you can be a, a, a garage, you know, prophet. You, you know, you, if, you, if, you can get you a, if you can get you a bunch of people just looking at your YouTube or looking at your post or whatever, and you can, there is Paul, he said, though you have 10,000 teachers, uh, have not many fa fathers. He if, he, if he, if he was writing it in 2016, soon to be 17, can you believe how quick this year is going by? If he was writing it now, he would say, though you have uh, millions of teachers, but they're not the right kind of teachers. Everybody, everybody now wants to post up. Everybody now wants to show, you know, what they, they know. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and yet, James says, the greater condemnation is on you if you don't know what you're saying. You're just putting a, a bridle in the horse's mouth in the body. Go ahead. Keep them on Jesus. Well, Paul said the exact opposite of that, and he said it several times. Look at me. Follow me as I follow Christ. 
And it wasn't saying that I'm your Lord. The book of Hebrews says he is looking unto him, the author and the finisher of our salvation. He's the ultimate one. So that if a man does make a mistake, a woman does make a mistake, uh, you, you can say, well, okay, that's not the exact prototype. But our life should be that we can say to people without excuse, look, I'm laying down my life. And uh, you don't stand up and publicly, you know, proclaim it. But you're living such a life that says, look, if you, if you, if you follow my prayer life, you're, you're going to be real successful. If you follow my uh, church attendance, you're going to be real faithful. If you follow my giving, uh, you're going to be a real good giver. If you follow my demeanor in walking in love, you'll follow the biggest. Don't follow me now. Do as I say. I can tell you what to say. Just don't do, just don't do what I do. That's the biggest cop out it's ever been. So, uh, the one that is going to receive the greater condemnation is this, is if you're posting up or if you're giving your opinion, uh, make sure it's not your opinion, make sure it's Christ's. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the other thing, too, is if, if you get flack back from it and it makes you mad, you shouldn't have never been there anyway because you're not qualified. If it, uh, if it makes you really mad and upset. Now, you can have a righteous kind of like, my God, that's pitiful. You know, they're going to, if they're going to wind up in hell, if they keep doing that, that's a, a loving kind. But if it burns you, I, I like football to pieces. I just love it to pieces. Uh, but I realized years ago I had to cross a line. I realized it when it was, and this is amazing. I realized it when it, when it was my God. Because it, you can have a bunch of little gods. A bunch of them. A, 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 you know, the word says, let us lay aside the weight and the sin. It wasn't nothing like, you know, lusting or anything like that. But this is just one of them things. If, if I could get in a, a, a talk with somebody. Now, you can, football is one of those kind of things that you can just share your, you know, your opinion on. And you can go back and, well, I don't think he's the best. Well, I don't think, oh, I think, yeah, well, there's a but You can go on like that all day, and that's okay to, with God. But when it raises hair on the back of your neck and your heart starts pumping, mm-hmm. Well, I'm just a good fan. No, it's a little God. It's a little God. And whatever your hobby is, if you can discuss it and people don't agree with that hobby, and, you know, I used to, uh, uh, it, it, was, it was too much for me, like with my hunting. Now, I can go when I want to now, but I don't hardly do it at all anymore. I love it. But I, when people was like, I gotta be careful. <laughs> it might not be saying <laughs> when the tree, the tree huggers, you know, <laughs> okay, Lord. <laughs> He's like, okay, make sure you're still dead. <laughs> when they'd start in on me, I'd just start saying things that start saying things that just make them go just to have ah, crazy, <laughs> crazy. Well, there ain't nothing wrong with it. Nothing in a word about it. You can hunt all you want to. But when I found somebody that would just really thought that they knew something by the, you know, and wanted to challenge me, then I just do my best to aggravate them. <laughs> and I can aggravate you. <laughs> I can. Candy says, yes, he can. <laughs> she gave me a great glowing report. <laughs> well, where were we at in all this? A greater condemnation. So everything that is in you, because not everything inside of me is dead. But when people can get you with your hobby or your this or that or, your, or your what you're making your stand on, make your stand. Die for it. You're a martyr. Be a martyr for Christ if you had to. But don't hate people. Don't hate people. Hallelujah. There's no way for us to ever get to where we're supposed to go this morning. <laughs> but we're getting good stuff. Hallelujah. Real good stuff. Praise the Lord. Um, 
2 Peter chapter 2. Let's just review just a little bit. And man, I would love to, uh, we may get to Jude. We may get to Jude or we may, but it's all right if we don't get to Jude because we're learning. Amen. Just to recap a little bit from uh, last week, 2 Peter chapter 2. We went into all kinds, uh, we, we read the chapter, and basically I said this, and we're not going to read this chapter in full again. We are going to read the bottom part of it because I want to show that illustration to anyone that may have missed it, and I want to show it just, it's just real good illustration, the bottom part of chapter 2. There are two, I said last week, there are two comparative uh, Scriptures, um, passages, uh, equal value, of course, but almost simultaneously saying the same thing, and they're foretelling prophecies. In other words, uh, prophecy can be saying what is happening presently in the mind of Christ for a present tense moment, but uh, prophecy also many times is foretelling or, or, or forthtelling, telling the future, and uh, these were two foretelling prophecies. Now over in Jude, he said that these men that we're describing had present tense crept in. In other words, some of that was already going on, but he goes on later in Jude to describe, and we'll show that when we get to it, that it's also equally a prophecy that things will come. I said last week, and I said, my goodness, this is amazing to me, and I really mean it. It's not just to stir you up, but I really mean that 2 Peter 2 and Jude are, to, to my knowledge, the best that I can see, they are present tense prophecies that we're living out right now, right now in 2016. So uh, I always wanted to be in the Bible, and I am now. But, and I'll say this, I'm not, but my generation is. In other words, I'm not associated with these negative things, but I'm associated with the positive part that's making the stand against them. But I tell you, as, as surely as I stand here, um, when we read the Bible, uh, uh, the parts that we, you know, Jesus has already come. His words are living words. In other words, they'll live for all generations, and we're supposed to do his commandments. But those things took place then. There's Revelation, the book of Revelation. That's going to take, most part of that is, I think part of that, a little bit of it is taking place right now. But that's going to take place in the future. It's uh, comparative readings with the book of Daniel and uh, some, some other places as well. But I'll tell you what, these words are words of right now. These are newspaper. I'm t I'm, this, is, this is Naples Daily News or, or Fort Myers or New York Times. This is happening in the spirit realm. And so uh, primarily what we've been talking about in Bayonet Training is Radical grace, uh, exaggerated grace, teachers that are speaking to the body of Christ. I've, for weeks, I've tried to say, and I believe I've gotten across, that I'm not upset with these guys. We prayed some services for them, not as in a pretense uh, to say this gives us a license to do what we're doing, but we really sincerely desire that these men and their ministries will be turned around. Really desire. But these things here that we're looking at, they truly are a present tense, uh, or, or the, the, the prophecy present tense being fulfilled. Now, beginning in the first part of this, and then we're going to skip on down uh, to the latter part. It says here in verse 1, referring back to, the, to the, what he was talking about in chapter 1, talking about how that there were prophecies that were... Uh, that stood for the, uh, the coming Messiah and spoke of his coming. And they were, they were the sure words of prophecy that Peter was talking about. But here he says here, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily or privately shall bring in damnable heresy, we broke down all these words last week, damnable, heresies, even denying, talked about, we said, what does denying the Lord 
mean, brought, uh, even denying the Lord that bought them, and will bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. These are big King James words, but we broke them all down last week. Please listen to those, if, that message if you haven't. It's called the revolving door. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, who through uh, covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth and their damnation slumbereth not. Then he goes into talking about how that if God spared not, you know, different things like Sodom and Gomorrah, the world that was associated with Noah, Sodom and Gomorrah, gave those an example. And he said that he really gave all those examples for the purpose of showing how that God could preserve people and he also could simultaneously judge people. And that's what's going to take place in this last day and hour. It says in verse 14, that these having full eyes full of adultery, they cease not from sin, beguiling. Now this is, he started, did he not start this chapter off by telling us that his subject matter was false teachers. Yes, he did. These were not people outside of the church. They were inside of the church. Beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercise with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken their right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Besor. We, we've really talked about this guy before in the past. Don't have time today who loved the wages of unrighteousness, who was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. And he says, these are wells without water. They're clouds that are carried with a tempest whom in the midst of darkness is reserved forever. You will see these same words when and if we get to it today. If not, I hope that you'll remember that we made mention of this when we do get to Jude this week or next. And when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they, now this is where really we wound up last week, and I thought it was an excellent illustration, and I want to say it just briefly again this morning. And when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were a clean escape from them who live in error. We'll stop right there. We, don't, we won't go into all of what we went last week, but please listen to the message. Go on YouTube, watch it if you weren't part of last week's service already. It is describing something here I feel is um, from a disposition of watching the enemy. I, I don't want to give him credit, too much credit. Uh, he is the created. He is one day going to confess to, to, to before his, uh, to everyone, before all nations, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every tongue shall confess, every knee shall bow. And then he's going to go into eternal judgment. Thank God that guy is going to be incarcerated forever. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. He's one place, we're another place. That's a good deal for me. Hallelujah. Good deal. Um, but I, I really feel like that when I read this, and only God could dissect this, that the enemy had uh, an ingenious plan. And it's pretty ingenious. Um, it's not foolproof because God breaks the foolproof off of it. He, the, the, what can fool people, God has a remedy, has an antidote for that. And praise God, we know what that is. That's praying in other tongues and the Word of God. And we can prove that in the book of Jude. But I, I really feel like this is a pretty ingenious uh, way to do something because what he does is he raises up false teachers. Now, how do false teachers become false teachers? Just like good teachers become good teachers, line on line, precept on precept. Sometimes it takes a man many, many, many years to really go awry, to go astray, to go too far to where that you begin to say, wow, this is way too far. And, and I'm praying, my heart's desire is that you know, we haven't got to the ready reference part yet. The ready reference is something we're going to present to you and say, here's something that you can use as a loving argument to those who are on the edge and to who anybody that might be saying, uh, we believe in what we're describing as a radical grace. Gone too far. And do we love grace? Yes. Amen. Let's say it again. Do we love grace? Yes. Amen. 
How did we ever get saved except through His grace? Hallelujah. How are we ever going to change? Because I'm not there yet. we got to have grace. We're not divorcing ourselves from grace. We're divorcing ourselves from the exaggerated or undescribed grace of the Word of God. Now, you, you're going to get an opportunity to pull people back in. I, and I believe that. I really believe that. We had testimony. Somebody come up and told us. Somebody they know been listening to these and said, I'm not going to listen to that no more. And they don't even go to this church. I think that's wonderful. But a description here is given that says that these last day men will use a mechanism that's incredible. It, it just really is. Uh, it, it could only be conceived by a, a brighter brain than what most humans have. Because the fact of the matter is, or the, the, the truth according to the word of God is this, it, it, uh, it's a, it, it's, you could say it this, it's an extortion, it's a utilizing of something that people have uh, working in them even after salvation. When he says here, um, when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the, the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from the, who live in error. In other words, the brilliance of that is this. We, we described last week, I called it the revolving door. It could actually have been called uh, um, the inoculation of deception. And, and, that was in, and that was a good way, but a, a good illustration. But I called it the revolving door in this sense of the word is that because what we see here exemplified in 2 Peter is this. Um, there is a picture here that people can enter in to Christ. And the greatest thing about entering into Christ, one of the greatest things is it's simplicity. Absolute simplicity. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to be going to a church. You don't have to be indoctrinated. You just have to understand this. You do have to understand this. Jesus is the only way. And Jesus came from heaven to earth, stood in your place, received all the sin of mankind. You have to understand you were a sinner and that you were destined to hell without his intervention. And that when you ask Jesus to become your Lord, you put him on, you believe that what he did was not just universal, what, you, what he did was personally meant for you. And when you personalize that and say, I believe that personally for me, Jesus went there for me, I identify with his, his, his crucifixion, my sins were on him on the cross, I receive you, Jesus, your death, I believe you died, I believe you went to hell, and I believe you were resurrected. If you, leave, if you just believe in his death, you have no resurrection and it doesn't work. I believe that you died for me, Jesus. You were resurrected for me. You're still alive, Jesus. I receive this. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. It's real simple. It's just real simple. If thou shalt believe in thy heart, confess with thy mouth, thou shalt be saved. Don't have to know a thing in the world. No doctrine, nothing. That's the inroad. That's the stepping in. But what happens is, as a description here, is what I was showing last week is that there is a revolving door. People come in. And if they stay under the teaching, the, the, here's the travesty. The travesty is this, is uh, if they, once they've gotten in as infants, if they fall under the God help, if they fall under the misfortune of bad teaching, um, or some who have been in it a long time, uh, been in that circle of, or been inside of Christ, if they get involved through, through uh, uh, os the osmosis of, of watching social media, or watching uh, the, the, the gospel, all the gospel uh, programs and stuff, and they just begin to, by interest, sometimes it'll just start just by innocence, like, what is that guy saying? And then you say, wow, he's got some good stuff, and wow, that sounds pretty good. And then, it, it, but there will be checkpoints, There'll always be checkpoints if you are, are, you know, if you're gods and just that innocence uh, of wanting to know the Lord and God, God will do his best once he gets you in to, to, be, to get you going in the right direction. But you're, you're volatile. You're very volatile at that time at the, at the beginning and can be later on. Even prescribed uh, 20 year olds in Christ have gone that direction. But the revolving door is this. You can go in. It's just straightforward. You can go in, 
But if you fall under the allure, what is the allure? The allure is they reel you in by going after something that they know exists. Now, they don't maybe think this way. This is how the mastermind behind them thinks. This is how the, he thinks. He propagates in them falsehood that says, let me reel you in by the allure of the flesh. In other words, when we got born again, we could teach spirit, soul, and body all day. But real simple, where's the Holy Ghost do his work? Inside, in the invisible, the real you, the spirit person. That's the part that changes. Progressively, your soul changes. It will be renewed to the Word of God. And it does the whole... The born-again spirit does have an immediate effect on the soul. You stop, you know, you stop doing things immediately that you used to do. I mean, people get born again tonight and tomorrow. They may have been a horrible cusser and, they, and just they, they might cuss the next day a little bit, but they're like, wow, I don't like to do that no more, you know? Or they may have been a, you know, this or that and the other. And the, and the, next, the very next day, their thoughts are condemning them. So there is an immediate effect. There's an absolutely immediate effect. But many things uh, are progressively worked out. And those are strongholds. Um, you're still God's child, but uh, they're strongholds. And what, what this teaching does, it, oh, gotcha. How do I gotcha? How do I snag you? I snag you through the, the, uh, the lust of the flesh. The, the King James says the much wantonness, uh, that's lasciviousness. How I hooked you is I'm telling you something that pulls on your flesh. And what I'm telling you that pulls on your flesh is he says that they, he promises them liberty. In other words, here is a reconciliation of your flesh and spirit. There is no reconciliation. There's always going to be a war, but there can be extreme peace. The stream, extreme peace comes through dominance. The extreme peace comes through a place of saying, look, my flesh, I'm not just talking about this body. The body is part of the flesh, but the, pot, the, the combination of flesh is this, the unrenewed soul and your body. Your body does have an appetite. You're, even when your brain's not necessarily thinking, your body will tell you stuff, and then your brain will think it. <laughs> uh, so uh, some of you are thinking right now, I want to go eat. I want to go eat. <laughs> When is he going to be done? I want to go eat. We just rebuked that, okay? Uh, but they allure through much lasciviousness, still God's child, but they're pulling on by, by what? I promise you liberty. I can reconcile without suffering. And they go into all these exaggerated teachings in which we've covered over the last several weeks. One of them that is a really good exaggerated teaching is, look, um, you don't have to repent. You don't have to repent because all of your sins have been forgiven forever, past, present, and future. And if you don't have to repent, you don't have to, you, 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 you're just, you don't even have to, then if you don't have to repent, then why carry the condemnation? And then the other part is that leaks out in all that is why, why beat yourself up? over having to change. In other words, if you've got a man, sir, if you've got a lust problem, if you're looking at stuff, God just loves you. You don't need to, you know, don't beat yourself up. Uh, you know, you've, that sin's already been forgiven. And just, you know what? Uh, it is the, it's the, see, because it, there's another side. They look at us. They're looking at us like we are the Pharisees. They look at us like our interpretation of the word of God is uh, legalistic, pharisaical, but we've taken line on line and showed you right by the word of God that where we're standing is to the best of our ability, praying in tongues, looking at line on line uh, that the word of God does not teach, does not teach a gospel that you should not repent when you do sin, but that you should absolutely and must repent. And repent doesn't mean saying, God, I'm sorry. Repent doesn't mean just repentance means I won't do it no more. I'm not going to do that no more. I, I, I mean, uh, repentance, when somebody thinks of repentance, if you think repentance is saying, I'm sorry, God, forgive me. And then I, I'm taking a repentance pill so I can do it again next Friday night. That's not repentance. You didn't get forgiven. Well, you know, I did too because I asked him to forgive me. No, no, no. You, your, your heart canceled out because you didn't really truly repent. 
When you say, God, forgive me, meaning I'm not going to do it no more, you get cleansed. Now, what if you do do it again? If you meant it, I'm not going to do it no more, and your flesh, if you bow the knee to the flesh again, will he forgive? Yes, he will. 70 times 70. He, you know, or he will forgive you. But people think because they go through the motion of saying, forgive me, even us that believe in forgiveness, if you say forgive me with the intent on the back of your brain saying, I can't wait till next Friday night, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> you didn't get forgiven for the present because you didn't mean what you said presently. You're just, that's a pretense of prayer. It do doesn't work. Doesn't work. Hallelujah. So he, they reel them in and they, so they, they're in Christ, but the problem is, is they're on their way out of Christ and they don't even know it. They're on their way out because if they stay in and listen, I said this last week and I, I, I see where we're not going to get to Jude at all. And I very rarely almost repeat, you know, we, we always kind of bring you up to, to speed, but this is almost a repeat of last week with a few other things added. So he just wants me to stay here and I got to stay here. Um, once they step in, if they come under the allurement of this kind of teaching, and believe me, folks, it is alluring. It is alluring. My flesh doesn't want to fast. Now, I love praying in tongues, and, and, and I love studying the Word of God, and I love the benefits of fasting. Once I get into one a few days or something, and then all, everything gets quiet, um, I'm like, man, I'm all, I, I preach. But anybody's flesh doesn't necessarily like uh, to just stop eating. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I like my, you know, my tall glass of cold milk at night and, and, you know, just a handful of something a little sweet. That's really nice. The greatest, the greatest drink ever God ever made is milk. Cold milk is the best thing that God ever made. But, uh, but when I realize I got to go to bed tonight and I don't get my little glass of my, and I try to make it skim milk. I love whole milk. Oh God. In heaven, I'm just going to get drink fountains of whole milk and never gain weight. But uh, so this allurement comes through the flesh. Let's read this. Let's read the rest of it. Uh, it says here, they promised them liberty. No, this is what I was about to say about what, where I was going with the milk deal and stuff. Um, if you go that direction, and my flesh would love it as well as everybody else, the battle is over. It really is over. The battle, what battle? The battle of die, 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 die. Fast, pray, die, die, die. And I, cannot, I don't condemn these people. They're wrong. And they, they really run a horrible risk. But I understand what gets them. Uh, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. For if after they've escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? That means they, once they've got born again, they escape the pollution of the world. Have, have, can you all see that? I hope you can. Oh, last week we went over even more. They come out of the world. They escape the pollution. It means they, they got born again. Okay. Anybody tells you, well, no, this wasn't people that really got born. They escaped. They escaped. Everybody say escaped. They escape the pollution. Okay. They escape the pollution of the world through the what? The cross, the knowledge of Jesus. How simple is that? They escape through the knowledge of the Lord, or they escape through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If they are entangled, it doesn't say if there, but this is, the, this is what it's saying back to the beginning of verse 20. So the thought is carried. If they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now, this is an incredible, incredible verse. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. In other words, he just plain out says it'd be better if they didn't ever get saved. That's, that's really strange. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they've known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. Now, this is what he describes. The dog is, is turned to his own vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. 
What he's simply saying here, this is a perfect picture. Uh, we were filthy rags without Christ. We were, sorry ladies, we were sows wallowing in the mud. Once Christ came in, we're no longer, we're no longer sinners saved by grace. We're, we are the, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But if through a process, if through a process of time and effort, and listen, I don't believe, I said this last week, I do not believe that even the men that I have mentioned are the really exact fulfillments of 2 Peter 2 and Jude. Not at this point. Uh, it says over in Jude, and we'll, we'll, we'll go there next week, it says these men turn the grace of God, and it's talking about the same subject. I know this is why I know that we're in a 2016 subject matter. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now, I have said, and I still believe this to some degree, that this couldn't be these men yet. These are only the first generation of things to come. I have said that uh, these men are not yet fulfilling that word that they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness uh, because they're not preaching um, go out and sin, go out and fornicate, go out and commit adultery. They're not saying that. They're just taking away the penalty. But I will all say, also say this simultaneously with that. As I have looked at the word turning and meditated that, and I don't want to just read too much into this because it's not my objective to, to bash these guys. But the word turning means is to begin to, uh, we'll read it. I actually have it in my notes this morning, but I'm saving you time. It actually means to begin to uh, transcend or go in that direction. It doesn't mean that you just stand up one day and just speak a blatant false doctrine. It means, it can mean that you begin to turn, turn the ship in that direction. So in that sense of the word, even being the first generation, they are already beginning to turn the body of Christ by the millions in a direction that is absolutely not prescribed in the word of God. And that led up, that's saying this, I said all that to say this, I do not believe that all the people that ever go after this are just going to wind up you know, in hell. I do not believe that. I believe, um, I see many of these people that I'm looking at and say, you know, you're listening to something very dangerous. Um, there are really dangerous uh, uh, things that can, can happen to you. And uh, eternity could be in the balance if this thing progresses, at least to your children or grandchildren, if you stay into this. Um, because many times, uh, people that have been in the church and, and, they, and they're real strong already in righteousness. They have those righteous or those holiness roots. Even if they go after this, they're still, those righteous roots are in them so strong. It, it, they're not going to just walk away from those righteous roots, even though they're hearing something that their flesh likes. In other words, just because somebody hears this and it's wrong doesn't mean they're just going to go right into the bars the next week. That's not what we've been saying. But what it says here is that there is a potential, and it definitely exists. And if you follow this all the way out, the potential will turn into a reality. And the potential is this. The hog that was once, the, the, the sow that was once clean, that just changed, she's no longer a sow now, uh, can then revert back into the waller, can revert back into, back into another species and then turn into uh, a sow again and go back to the world again. Well, how does this happen? It says here, this is amazing. It would have been better off for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, turn from it. Well, why would it say that? My, my deal is this. I think it's better. I think that it's better. My thoughts, it'd be better for anybody at any time always to get saved. That, why would it be better not for them to get saved? What he's saying is this. In the context of what he is sharing and the, predominance, the predominant effect of how that this message 
can have upon your life. In that situation, it would be better that you do not come in. And then if you do come in, be inoculated. Come here, uh, Harry. This deserves, now this is a bicycle or air pump or whatever. Uh, we used this as a syringe last week. You remember this? Pretty good illustration. It looks pretty good as far as a syringe, right? This is, uh, Harry came in. Harry's going back out, not to his own seemingly volition, but he's in that revolving state, stepped in through simplicity. Maybe stepped in through the open door. Maybe, maybe these ministries teach, maybe they teach just the blood at some point. Or maybe Harry gets saved and then some friend says, hey, look, you know, that church that you go to, I've got somebody else that you need to listen to. So he starts listening to them. Then what happens is, um, you know, Pastor Dave for years taught us an incredible message, and we're going to see that out of the book of Jude next week. We often termed it the inoculation against deception. In other words, inoculation is, you know, you, you get inoculated, you get a shot, and the shot will keep our children nowadays. I don't think any of the children get uh, chicken pox or anything like that. We all got them as a, as a kid. But they got all those vaccinations now that just vaccinate them and they don't even get them anymore. Pastor Dave used to teach us, and he, you know, he still does, this is his heart, uh, praying in tongues is an inoculation against future deception. It will not only rid what's in you, but it will also keep from you things that possibly could be coming. That's perfect. This, in contrast, is this. Uh, this understanding is that once you come in, by then you're in Christ, by the allurement of the flesh, if you stay under that, then something can happen to you as a result of staying under that, that Peter describes, it would have been better for you not, because now you're outside of Christ. What if in Christ, someone begins to teach you and inoculate you, Slowly, but surely, that you don't have to repent. You're good to go, no matter what you do or how long you do it or how long you stay in that adultery or, 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 or whatever. And I'm, I'm using the, you know, the really far out kind of immoral sins. Uh, you came into Christ, you were saved, but we, we slowly inoculate you. In other words, we put false teaching in you. Now, that false teaching, not only eventually, that false teaching not only eventually gravitates that person to a place of going back into an absolute mire situation, which means they, they're lost out. Now, is that place, is it easily done? No, I don't believe that. I believe the Holy Spirit fights. He'll do everything he can. If you could say this, the Holy Spirit will fight tooth and toenail to try to keep somebody from going back, going all the way back. Can it be done? Yes, it can be done. It's proven right here. Jude will talk about the trees that are tw twice dead. In other words, they were alive, then they died. Uh, they were dead, twice dead. They were dead, then alive, and then they died again. He, he talks about that. And Peter says the same thing. Uh, is a conscience that comes into the church, gets saved, and then goes back out and starts living like the world again, is a conscience that is grieved and is, you know, every time you talk to them, you, they say, I know, I know, I know I'm wrong, I know I'm wrong, God help me, I got to get back. And, you know, you know they, they do know it's wrong. And in a certain sense, they're crying out for repentance. If they really go to the full level of repentance, they'll stop doing it, like we said. But at least they're admitting it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. Pray for me. I, I know I got to get, I gotta, I gotta get out of the bars. I got to. That's much more healthy, even though it's not healthy. It's much more healthy than the inoculation that says, and this is where, this is where you come up with a summation, and this is where you see, see that what Peter was saying by the Holy Ghost really makes sense. When he says it'd been better for them not to come in 
and then go back under this pretense? What if this guy goes out, really makes the journey, it takes him a while, he gets Christ. See, when you're outside of Christ, there's no place else to go but to inside. There's no place else. And somebody's, you know, you, when you do know that you're a sinner, when Christ convicts you and somebody presents that to you, then there's no, there's no other place but to go forward. You can't, you can't go laterally. You have to go forward. The next place, once you're convicted and you say, I want to respond to this, the next place is just to go through that door. That's the simple, the simplicity. There's, at, at that place, praise God, there's no other place to go but up. There's no place to go but up. You know you need help. I need help, so I'm going up. What if once you go up or you go through that door and you know you need help, what if in time somebody inoculates you with such deceptive teaching and gravitates you very slowly into believing things like, uh, that's not a sin necessarily, that's not a sin, or if it is, I still don't have to repent because I repented a long time ago. What if their, their conscience gravitates them to a place where they step outside. Now the problem is this. When a person is backslidden, we call it backslidden, and yet they're still healthy enough that to show that there's, there's, there's something there. They're, they're really upset. They're just miserable to pieces. They're just miserable. That's good. That's good. Why? Because that shows you that there's still some kind of conscience there trying to bring them back to where they need to be. What if this guy goes out and he's out, but he doesn't know he's out and he can't get back in? Why can't he get back in? Wouldn't God forgive him? Oh, yeah, God will forgive any heart that says, Lord, forgive me. I won't back in. But what if he's out? He doesn't know he's out. He doesn't believe he's out, and he won't even repent for being, being out because he believes, as Jesus said, the light that is in him. See, the light is, is, is doctrine, is what you believe. If the guy that steps out and he doesn't know he's out, he can't get back out in. He could. He could get back in, but he can't get back in because he's been inoculated to believe that he's already in no matter what he does. And there's no reason to repent. So he spends the rest of his life not repenting, believing that he's already in, and it doesn't matter to God what he's doing. He's been inoculated. I, I think it's a very ingenious, very ingenious work of the enemy. But I know a mourn far above. Jude tells us there's a way to inoculate ourselves. And we're going to see, if we ever get there, how to help these people. It's through compassion. It's through love. And it is, my goodness, boy, did Pastor Dave hit it right years ago. He did not know. Well, maybe he did know. But he knew that he was teaching us about the inoculation of deception, how that we could inoc... But I don't know that he knew that that was an end time, that it was going to work for us in 2016 to inoculate us against those things that would take us out and also help provide a road back in for those who were involved in those places. Folks, don't stop praying in tongues. Don't stop praying in tongues. But can you see how that it would be worse? It would be worse to come under, if you come under, if you, it's never worse to enter the door. It's never worse to get saved. But it's worse if you get saved and then you're taught how to walk back out. And then once you get out, you don't believe you're out and you won't confess the way back in. So you have, inoc you have been inoculated to get back in because you believe that you're already in. That's pretty incredible. But I know one, the Holy Ghost. Thank you, sir. He is our teacher. He is our teacher. Hallelujah. Stand with me this morning. Praise the name of the Lord.